Bible evidences. Um, we've been looking a lot at what the Bible says about itself, which is perhaps different from a typical evidences-based lesson, and that is, of course, intentional, and we'll talk more about that in a future lesson, but for now, we're talking about the fact that belief comes from the Word. True belief, I say, true belief comes from the Word. So, in Romans 10, 17, it's a very simple principle. Faith comes from hearing. Hearing comes through the Word of Christ. The fact is, the genesis of faith is hearing the Word of Christ. <laughs> That's where faith comes from. What is faith? It's trust in God. You trust God, you believe God, you accept His Word because, because you have heard that Word, you've listened to it, given it a fair hearing, a fair shake, and it has proven itself to you. This is faith comes from hearing, hearing through the Word of Christ. So, again, there is not another genesis of faith. The only thing that creates belief in people or creates a trust in God that, that generates faith in us is His Word. That's it. There's not something else given here. And, you know, the parable of the sower is recorded in Luke 8. Um, and verse 11, he said, the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. If you're not familiar with the parable of the sower, you can look at the rest of Luke chapter 8. But effectively, the sower goes out to sow and he throws seed. And there are multiple different places where the seed lands. And the way that the plant um, succeeds or does not succeed is based on the nature of the soil where the seed lands. The seed is the word of God. So the word is what gets spread and whether it becomes a full-grown plant that produces fruit depends on the soil it lands on, which is our hearts. <laughs> if our hearts are stony and rocky, then the word of God just bounces and there's nowhere for a plant to grow. It never takes root. It doesn't turn into a Christian. Right? If the soil is shallow, it takes root, but only shallow root. It can't withstand heat or drought. And it falls away. That person became a Christian, but fell away. If it falls among thorns, if our heart is thorny, complicated, you know, distracted with things of life, then that seed may produce a plant and that plant may grow up but it's not going to produce any fruit because it's being choked now that's a christian who isn't living right <laughs> and finally seed that falls on the good ground produces fruit some you know threefold sixtyfold a hundredfold right but the point of the parable is the seed is the word of god it's the same word it's the same seed how it does depends on the nature of the heart that it lands on. The word is what produces the plants. The word is what makes the Christians. Nothing else makes Christians. All right? So we, we do this so as to make that point that there's not something else that you can use besides the Bible that will generate faith. If you want somebody to believe, if you want somebody to become a Christian, and we do, I do want you to believe, I want everybody to believe, I want everybody to become a Christian, but we can't make you do it, and we can't change the nature of the message, and the word is the thing that makes Christians, and people respond to the word, or they don't, and that's all the options there are. Well, we have other things, though, that are called belief. That we should talk about false belief i would say not real belief as the bible prescribes from the word false belief it's coming from somewhere else first john 2 15 to 17 is what we read in this do not love the world or the things in it if anyone loves the world the father the father's love is not in him all that's in the world are these three things and they are not from the father but from the world these three things are the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are where false belief comes from. For example, in John 6, when Jesus fed a crowd of 5,000, 
from just a handful of loaves of bread and fish. That was a notable miracle, yes. But when he absconded to the other side of the sea, they went looking for him. And when they found him, he said to them, John 6, 26, Truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but rather for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. So they had something of a belief in him, but it was a false belief based on the desires of the flesh. They had their fill of the loaves. It's a false belief based on the desires of the flesh, you see. This is, you know, this is like people thinking that what, the, what they need is relationships. What they need is a cohort of friends, uh, comrades, you know, somebody, a peer group, a peer level, that this is what uh, we need uh, to be right with God. No, it's not. What you need is the Word of God. You need the Bible. You need adherence to the Bible. It's great to have friends. It's great to find people of faith who are in your peer group, whatever that peer group is. I'm reminded of the venerable George Burns, you may recall. <laughs> they asked him the best thing about turning 100. He said, no peer pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, whatever your peer group is, it's nice to find somebody of the faith who has something in common with you in the flesh. That's fine. But that has nothing to do with your faith or your soundness or your durability. The word is what makes you a Christian. Don't work for food that perishes. The desires of the eyes. We have Thomas. Downing Thomas, as he's called. And I do want to look at the account here. In John 20, verses 24 to 31, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, wasn't with them when Jesus had come to them the first time. This is to say, the resurrected Jesus appears to the apostles, but Thomas wasn't there. So the other disciples said, we've seen the Lord. And he said, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, place my hand into his side, I will never believe. So Thomas doesn't accept the account of the others that they have seen the Lord, and they would know if they had seen him. Well, if you skip down a bit, Jesus tells Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, put out your hand, place it in my side, don't disbelieve, but believe. So when he appears to them another time and Thomas is there, he calls him over and says, hey, come, come over here. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, have you believed because you have seen me? That anticipates a no answer. Did you realize that? A valid translation here could be, you don't believe because you've seen me, have you? Or do you? You don't believe because you've seen me, do you? It's anticipating a no. <laughs> the answer to that is no. How do you know? Because he said, blessed are those who have not seen and have still believed. And also, because of 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Okay, we walk by faith, not by sight. That's blessed are those who have not seen and yet have faith, or yet have believed, have still believed. So Thomas comes, he sees him, and his response is, my Lord and my God, as if he believes. This is fake belief. Desires of the eyes, that's all this is. He just wants to see it himself. Maybe a little bit of pride, too. But he wants to see it himself. You call that belief? Not so. Blessed are those who haven't seen. That's belief. That's faith. And he closes this. John does. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples. You know, I think it's important to keep that context. Very often, these verses, the one that's 30 and 31, that's on the screen right now, um, these verses are very often taken as their own thing, like 
just some random note or appendix. No, it's part of the account of what happened with Thomas, who wanted to lay eyes on this. You don't need to lay eyes on this. You need the word. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is what it takes for you to believe in Jesus, that he's the Son of God, and for you to have life. The things that are written by John. You don't have to be, as Thomas is, standing there, saying that he believes because he can lay hands on this. He can see it. He doesn't believe. Jesus was very plain about that. No, that's not belief. The blessing comes to those who have not seen. And the pride of life shows up too in John chapter 5. When he cross-examines the Pharisees and scribes, those that say they believe in him, I don't know what's happening that this uh, projector keeps restarting, but sorry about that if it's if it's making a problem uh, for you online. I guess text somebody and let me let me know. <laughs> um, all right, pride of life. John five forty four to forty seven when he. Uh, chastises these that are supposed to know the Bible, they're supposed to know the law of Moses. He said, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? And so this is also not so much a matter of knowledge and facts as it is a matter of the heart. This is a fake kind of belief. It's pride of life that keeps them away. They're receiving glory from one another, not looking for the glory that comes from his word. Do not think I'll accuse you to the Father, says Jesus. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you've set your hope. Because if you believed Moses, you would believe me. Because he wrote about me. But if you don't believe his writings, how will you believe my words? This is an issue with the pride of life. They're receiving glory from one another and not interested in getting glory from God, which comes later, you know, maybe not here, maybe not with this world's acceptance and happiness. <coughs> yeah, if you really believed Moses, you'd believe me because he wrote about me. But you don't believe his writings, right? If you did, you'd believe in me. But if you don't believe his writings, how will you believe my words? We, you can't even get started. It's a non-starter if you don't accept the word of God. That's where it comes from. There's not another way to do this. But you can see how there are, how Satan has devised these schemes, right? Has devised these different ways that are actually just sin. Desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, pride of life. That's all these things are at the bottom of them. But they look like faith. It looks like they believe. They've got the right names. Right? And I want to spend a little time here in Second Chronicles 34. I'll pause for a moment because um, I want to explain this. It is the king Josiah of Judah, who was eight when he became king. Um, that we're going to look at. And there's a reason for this in regard to the word as the evidence. The things that Josiah is doing have at, at their as their backing or have as their basis exactly what we are talking about. He knows that the word of God is the solution. That's what this means. It is the evidence it is the proof it is the thing that is going to work second chronicles 34 in the 18th year of his reign it says in verse 8 when he had cleansed the land and the house 
Josiah sent individuals to repair the house of the Lord his God. So he made some officers responsible for this. And it's incredible, all the things that he did in the first seven verses here <laughs> without having the thing that they're about to find. The 11th verse, they gave money to the carpenters, the builders, to buy quarried stone and timber for binders and beams for the buildings that the kings of Judah had let go to ruin. I've kept this verse because I want you to see the difference between real faith and the kinds that we read about earlier. The false belief in God. They say they believe in God, but look. The house of the Lord, meaning the temple, needs quarried stone, timber for binders, beams for buildings. Why? Because the kings of Judah had let it go to ruin. It was falling apart, literally. This is not, you know, paint and spackle here. <laughs> uh, this is not quick, you know, put toothpaste in the, in the, uh, in the, um, uh, nail holes of the wall before you check out, you know, <laughs> of your dorm or your lease at the apartment. <laughs> These are foundational problems here. They've got, they allowed this to go into ruin. It's destroyed. Okay, so you understand what really happened. Then you find while they were bringing out the money that had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given through Moses. Well, it's kind of crazy that the house is decrepit and falling in, and inside that house is the book of the law of the Lord given through Moses. <laughs> that the law of God has the house caving in around it through disuse disrepair, disregard. That's how it is. The Bible does not get the use that it needs to get. It does not have the life that it should have among his people sometimes. We have to make it the centerpiece. Otherwise, the house falls into disrepair. Yeah, slowly, over time, we don't pay attention. We let things happen, let things slide. And it gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And at some point, you know, we remember that there used to be this book that we cared about, you know, but we're kind of following through all of the motions and traditions. And it kind of looks like what I heard that they used to do back in those days. Right? That's what's happening to the people. It's crazy to me to think that the high priest, Hilkiah, finds the book of the law. What was he doing until this point in time? How did he claim any kind of authority, pray tell? Now, this is crazy. I think it's crazy. Hilkiah responded to this, saying to the secretary, Shaphan, I've found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And he gave the book to Shaphan. <laughs> why is he doing this? Because nobody wants to be responsible for this. That's why. He doesn't want to take it to the king and get his head cut off. Here, secretary, uh, I found this. Why don't you let the king know about it? While I go, you know, to another room. <laughs> and Shaphan did the same thing. And he showed up. He said, oh, the work's going great. The, the money's come out. There's been a full accounting by all your servants. You know, he tells this long story. And then he comes around in 18 and 19. Oh, uh, there was another thing, King. Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. What book? A book, you say? What book? You see how they're all dodging? Nobody wants to admit that the Bible is real, the Bible is there, and they have paid it no attention. Nobody wants to admit that. That's the problem. Shaphan read from it before the king. And the king, on hearing the words of the law, tore his clothes. This is a sign of intense grief. He is mourning greatly when he hears this. 
Why is that, you say? <laughs> well, he'll tell you, but I just want to set the stage here. This king is a good king, and he's done wonderful things in his first 10 years of, of, of reigning, or his first 18 years, I guess, of reigning. And now he's cleaning up the house, repairing the house. They find the law. The priest doesn't want any responsibility for this. Even the secretary who's relaying the message doesn't want them to shoot the messenger. Nobody wants to take responsibility. When the king hears it, he mourns greatly. Why is that? Well, it's because he believes what it says. He heard what it said, and he believed it. How do you know this? Because the next thing he does is send them. In verse 21, Go, inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. Again, he says, Inquire of the Lord for me and those who are left in Israel and in Judah. He knew that there weren't many left in Israel and in Judah, that the people of God were flagging without the word. Now they have the word. He heard the word. He realizes something very specific, which is great is the wrath of the Lord poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all written in this book. He realizes we haven't been doing this. We haven't been keeping this. It's an amazing thing. I think Josiah is an amazing story. <coughs> He's saying you need to go ask what is about to happen because we are in deep trouble. We are in big, big trouble. We have not been doing what this book says. So he sent and they went and the response to him from the Lord comes. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring disaster on this place and its inhabitants. All the curses written in the book read before the king of Judah. So first answer is, this place is dead. I'm destroying it. Disaster is coming. Everything that you read in that book, that's what's going to happen here. That's the first thing. The second thing, to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, who even bothered to ask. He's the only guy who ever bothered to ask, apparently. Thus shall you say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and its inhabitants, and you've humbled yourself before me and torn your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Behold, I will gather you to your fathers. You will be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster that I will bring on this place and its inhabitants. So again, what's Josiah's response? Well, um, his heart was tender. He humbled himself before God when he heard the words that were against the place and its inhabitants. Is that how we respond when we find out that God's word does not approve of our actions and our activities? It needs to be. He was humble and therefore God has heard him. He said, I will gather you in peace. Your eyes will not see the disaster that is nonetheless still coming on this place. So what God told him is, disaster is coming for everybody. You will be gathered to your fathers in peace. I'm, I will not do it during your days. That's the word. So what do you do with that? <laughs> well, he gets the word of God, the law of God, and he repents 
and he realizes there's a lot that they need to do to be right with him. And so he inquires of the Lord, what is our fate? I know what it says. But he knows something else, doesn't he? Why would you send to inquire when you have read the curses in this book of the law? Well, he knows that God is merciful and that God will relent. That's why you send to ask. Well, they brought back word to the king and his response to this, I will destroy everything, but you won't see it. His response to it is better than Hezekiah's. Remember Hezekiah's response? The word of the Lord is good because at least there will be peace in my days. That's what Hezekiah did. Josiah sent and gathered together all elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites, all the people great and small. So the king's response is, everybody come here. For what? He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. <laughs> That's where this ends. Why did he do that? <laughs> After everything that we have read and everything that was said to him, why did he do this? <laughs> it's between the lines, you see, but it's there. Well, it worked for him, didn't it? He hadn't heard these words before. They hadn't even been found. When it was discovered and they pulled it out, he had them read it to him. And on reading it, he made things right with God in his own heart and appealed to God and received a measure of mercy from God for himself. What's going to work here? Well, the word of God is what's going to work here. Real faith, real belief comes from the word. Nowhere else. There isn't another source. He did not bring to bear royal authority, force, things of this nature. He made, other than to call an assembly to bring all the people together, which any king has a right to do. He brings all the people together and then he reads the word of the law of Moses to them. Now everybody has heard exactly what he heard. Right? This is because it is the answer. It is the thing that you do. It worked for him. It should work for them too. Any who were righteous rejoiced to hear this, although I'm sure they also realized that they were in grave danger because they knew this isn't what we've been doing. But they must have rejoiced in their hearts to know that the word of God was among them and that they knew what to do and how to please him and what they could uh, next, you know, what steps they could take to make things right, to repent. And you know, it's recorded here in Second Chronicles that, that one of the next things they did was to observe the Passover. And it's recorded here um, that nobody observed a Passover among any of the kings of Israel the way that Josiah did. It had not been done this way since the days of Samuel the prophet. Since before they had a king. No king observed the Passover the way that Josiah observed the Passover. So they repented. They made things right. Some of them did. Not enough of them to de deliver the land, as you find out later. But some did. By, by all means they did. The word of the book of the covenant that had been found, that was read to him, was read to the people. Because that is the right answer. It's the thing that saved him. It's the thing that will save them. You see, it's between the lines, but it's there, isn't it? He doesn't say, oh, God said he's going to destroy you. You better listen. You know, I'll throw you in jail if you don't come to church. No, he didn't say that. He said, 
you come here and you listen to this thing that I never heard. And I know you've never heard it either. And when they heard the book, when they heard the Bible, it had its effect. That's all that we're getting at. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's what we said earlier. It comes by hearing and by the word of God, the word of God. The seed is the word of God. The thing that makes plants is the word. There's not another uh, source that is available to us. And when you talk about evidence, well, the Bible is its own evidence. It's its own proof. There's lots of things that are called belief that are nothing but human relationships, human traditions, uh, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life. The only thing that really generates faith is the word. You can see how Josiah conducted himself in this matter. It was remarkable. And uh, I think that he is probably the best example. That's why I picked him for the second half of the lesson here. Because, again, it worked for him. It should work for you too. It's the only thing that's going to work, if anything. He had all the tools at his disposal. And he put forth the word of God and read it. This is the most important thing we can do. You've got to be reading your Bible. You have to give Bibles to people who don't have them. Make sure that those who are in your charge have access to and exercise their Bibles. Get people to read this word because that is where faith comes from. You want to see people obey the gospel? Put the Bible in front of them. All right. We do talk every time we come together about your need to obey the gospel. On hearing these words, what do you do with them? Josiah, you know, as is recorded, Josiah uh, tore his garments. He, he was very saddened at what happened. Um, and so he didn't just get angry go after the people set forth curses or for that matter he didn't just lay back like Hezekiah seems to have done he took action based on what he knew to be right and what he knew was going to help because of what the word itself had said today if you are not a Christian you need to take action you need to become a Christian a child of God to have for yourself forgiveness of sins now the blood of Jesus is shed for you and for me to wash away sins none of us is perfect and none of us has reached a sinless perfection or ever will but you do make a genuine effort to live right and God will help you we have water ready to help you to be baptized in the name of Jesus for forgiveness of sins are you a Christian a child of God who hasn't lived right look at the examples that are before us in God's word and consider these things in your own life if you need the prayers of the saints we're glad to pray with you for you that you might be brought back to him you might be restored to uh, your standing with God and we might rejoice with you if today you need our prayers or need to be baptized in his name let your need be known by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected <laughs> 